to Polygamy, What Love Is This? We're glad you're here tonight for our show. My name is Doris Hansen. I'm the host for the program. Tonight we are not broadcasting live from Salt Lake City because tonight's program is a pre-recorded one. And I'll explain to you why in just a moment that we are taping the program instead of being live. Because we are not doing a live show, uh, we won't be taking any telephone calls uh, halfway through the program like we normally do. And I'll explain to you about that in just a little bit as well. But first I'd like to remind you of the web page that we have for people who are interested in going to find out a little more about biblical polygamy and about um, people, stories of people who have left polygamy. Uh, you can find that out on shieldandrefuge.org and uh, you will be able to read stories of people who have left and have not regretted it. They've lived a productive, joyful life. Uh, you can find out um, what God's real plan of salvation is on that website. There's also a contact page that you can contact someone if you need help or if you uh, are being abused in any way, a physical or a sexual abuse uh, that is illegal, whether you're a man or woman, boy, girl, child, it doesn't matter. You can still get the help that you need and you can find it from the contact page on that website. So we invite you to go there um, for the information that you might be looking for. Also, our webpage for the program is aboutpolygamy.com. You can go there and find uh, past programs on streaming video and also future programming is listed. And our email address is tv at aboutpolygamy.com. We do invite you to email us concerns and questions that you may have about polygamy, private information that you might want to communicate. And um, we do offer from time to time on the show resources and charts and of course we use references. And that uh, you may email us if you don't um, get the references as we're talking and speaking, you can also email us and we will be happy to send them to you. And also the charts and references that we have been offering. Because our interview uh, tonight relates to the early Mormon blood atonement teaching, our historical moment tonight is concerning blood atonement. Now, although blood atonement was not directly related to the so-called prophecy of polygamy that Joseph Smith uh, supposedly commanded from God, it comes very closely connected uh, a little bit later on in the early Mormon history and also in more recent events <coughs> like the Lafferty brothers and the Irville LeBaron uh, terror and murder that was perpetrated from that group. But let's go back to the beginning of the blood atonement when it first began to be talked about and that was by Joseph Smith. In the documentary history of the church, Joseph Smith said, I am opposed to hanging if a man kill another. I will shoot him or cut off his head, spill his blood on the ground. That's what Joseph Smith said. Of course, the word blood atonement isn't used, but he's saying if someone murders another, his blood needs to be spilt upon the ground. Now let's go to Brigham Young. Um, Brigham Young, he was more uh, 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 active in teaching and talking about the blood atonement doctrine. And I want to make a couple of quotes here that Brigham Young also said. Brigham Young said, there are sins that men commit for which they cannot receive forgiveness in this world or in that which is to come. And if they had their eyes open to see their true condition, they would be perfectly willing to have their blood spilt upon the ground. And then he goes on to say, it is true that the blood of the Son of God was shed for sins, yet men can commit sins which it can never remit but they must be atoned for by the blood of the man. This was a sermon that was printed in the Deseret News in 1856. Now, he's saying that Jesus' blood will take care of some sins, but he's saying there are some sins that only the blood of the sinner will atone for. Now, that's pretty heavy stuff. And this is the blood atonement doctrine of the early Mormon church. Now, the blood atonement 
was practiced as well as talked about by the people in the early Mormon church. And it was brought to an even more violent level by the recent incidences that I mentioned earlier of the Lafferty brothers and the um, Ervil LeBaron polygamists. The doctrine of blood atonement to pay for the sinner's own sin is so far removed from what Jesus himself taught about it that it proves once again that false religions thrive because of biblical illiteracy. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 31, Jesus said, All manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit shall not be forgiven unto men. Now Jesus said all manner of sin will be forgiven except the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Now the word all is operative here. All manner of sin, he said. And in 1 John 1, 9, he says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. There's that word all again. He will con can, uh, cleanse us from all unrighteousness if the sinner will truly repent, the blood of Jesus Christ will indeed enable the forgiveness and the cleansing by God of the sinner. So we know from the Bible that what the early Mormons were teaching about blood atonement is against the biblical teachings. Now, what about the more recent LDS spokesmen? What have they said about blood atonement? Well, let's go to the infamous Bruce McConkie. He said that some sins like murder cannot be covered by Christ's blood and that the sinner's own blood needs to be shed to atone for the sin. And this is a quote from McConkie, Mormon Doctrine, page 92. But under certain circumstances, there are some serious sins for which the cleansing of Christ does not operate. And the law of God is that men must then have their own blood shed to atone for their sins. Murder, for instance, is one of those sins. Hence, we find the Lord commanding capital punishment. Well, why didn't Jesus tell us that? Jesus is the Savior. And it takes Bruce McConkie 2,000 years later to give us this information. According to Bruce McConkie, Joseph F. Smith also taught the blood atonement doctrine. You know, teaching that Jesus' death on the cross is not adequate for sinners to be forgiven from the sin of murder, and then on top of that, teach that the sinner's own blood can atone for his sins, is a distortion of enormous proportions. We have already quoted verses that tell us that sins will be forgiven, even the serious sin of murder. But let's look at another verse. 1 John Chapter 1, verse 7 says, And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. There's that word all again. There's no exceptions there of murder. Now, I've heard some people say that David, King David from the Old Testament, was not forgiven, that he was righteous in all his ways except the affair with Bathsheba and Uriah, and because of the murder of Uriah, David never reached the highest exaltation because he couldn't be forgiven of that sin. But if you want to go to 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 13, you will read that Nathan the prophet told David after he confessed that his sin was taken away. And if you want to go to Psalm chapter 51, you will read in all of its entirety the confession and repentant prayer of David. And David indeed was a forgiven sinner, a forgiven murderer through the blood of Jesus Christ. Joseph Smith, Brigham Young, Joseph F. Smith, and Bruce McConkie's teachings grossly contradict what the Bible teaches. Jesus' blood will cleanse us from sin. If only we confess them, that is what the Bible teaches us. We need to turn to Christ alone for salvation and ask Him to forgive us uh, in true repentance. Jesus is the Savior. 
we can't possibly be our own savior. And if somebody needs to die or be murdered in cold-blooded murder, I might add, to try and atone for their own sins, that makes that sinner his own savior. And on top of that, what makes anyone think that their blood is more precious and valuable than the blood of Jesus Christ? Jesus was God, is God. Acts chapter 20, verse 28 tells us that, that, G, uh, that God was the one on the cross, that God himself shed his blood for the church. That's Jesus Christ. Nobody's sinner's blood can ever, ever meet up with the strength and power excuse me, cleansing power of the blood of God. And one wonders how, man, uh, how a man like Brigham Young or Joseph Smith, who calls himself a prophet of God, could possibly believe in and preach and practice the blood atonement doctrine. I'm going to tie this in pretty quickly, so hang on. Now, many Mormon apologists <coughs> will deny that the blood atonement was practiced, but that it was... Um, <coughs> Uh, taught for uh, maybe another dispensation, but that it was never practiced. However, if you will check it out, find some history and read it. Don't read the Clorox version of the Mormon history because you won't get the truth, the, all, the whole truth. But find the true history and you will find many, many times where uh, the blood atonement was preached and also practiced. Because of these teachings of the early Mormons, self-proclaimed prophets like Ervil LeBaron began taking out his own enemies in cold-blooded murder, and he used his own people and the control that he had over their minds to do these things. He had them commit the blood atonement acts for him. One of those people was Rena Shanoth, she is the woman who pulled the trigger of the gun that killed the prophet of the Allred group, the Apostolic United Brethren, Rulon Allred, and killed him because Ervil LeBaron had sent her for that blood atonement task. In April, when the uh, YFZ Ranch rescue attempt took place, uh, myself and a good friend of mine, Susan Schmidt, went down to El Dorado and we spent eight days down there and I had the privilege of meeting Rena Shanoth while I was there. Rena is a beautiful, sweet, kind, quiet woman who glows with the love of God within her. And I want you to know that Rena, who shot Rulon Allred, has Jesus Christ as her Savior. She's been forgiven, and she knows she's been forgiven because she's turned to him alone. I contacted Rena after the, we began doing our Thursday night shows, and I asked her, if she's ever in the Salt Lake area, would she come on and be a guest on the program? Rena graciously declined and said, no, I don't do personal interviews anymore. I understand why, and, and so I didn't push her for it, but she did say, that she has a friend and a relative who knows so much about her and her own personal story that if we wanted to do an interview for Rena or with Rena, we could do it by proxy. And so we've decided to do that. It's taken a lot of time to think about and plan. And uh, so we have decided to do a proxy interview. And Susan Schmidt is the one that we're going to interview on Rena's behalf. Susan is a friend of Rena's and also her cousin. They were both raised in the LeBaron polygamy group down in Mexico. And so we are going to interview Susan on behalf of Rena. Now, remember, tonight's program is pre-recorded. Please do not telephone. We are not going to open up the telephone lines halfway through like we normally do. So don't call the studio. There's no one there. It's, an, it's empty. No one will be answering your telephone. However, we do want to hear your response. After you hear this interview and hear Rena's story, we would like to know the response of our viewing audience. So please email us your questions, your concerns, or your responses to tv at aboutpolygamy.com. And at some show in the future, we will set aside a block of time to answer the questions 
and to uh, respond to the comments and the concerns that you have emailed us. So please uh, respond by email and not by telephone call. And so uh, I'd like to introduce Susan Schmidt to you right now. Uh, Susan, we want to thank you for being here. It's my pleasure. Um, she, Susan was here a few weeks ago, uh, and we interviewed Susan on behalf of herself. Uh, but now tonight, of course, it's, we're going to uh, uh, interview on behalf of Rena Shanoth. And so, Susan, yes. would you please, for the sake of those who maybe are not familiar with Rena's story or even the LeBaron story, mm -hmm. would you kind of give us um, a brief outline of how you know her, how the Shanoffs and you got your family got into the LeBaron group, and right. and bring us up to to where we can start asking you the questions. Okay, <laughs> sounds good. Um, yes, Rena and I, we were we were both raised in the Colonial LeBaron colony, uh, in Joel LeBaron's church, which was called the Church of the Firstborn of the Fullness of Times, and I was a child of six when my parents moved me to. Uh, Mexico uh, along with my family my my siblings there was uh, actually five of us five of my my dad's nine children it was my dad and my mother and and the youngest of their children mm -hmm. and we moved to Colonial LeBaron where uh, came out of the LDS church and had joined Joel LeBaron's church and we moved to Mexico so that we could be in the real Zion mm -hmm. is what we okay. call it among the real saints oh interesting yeah. so yes um, so I was raised in Colonial LeBaron well, it wasn't too long after we joined the church that my dad went to his sister, Thelma, who was Rena's mother, and he told her, she was also LDS, about um, this fundamentalist group that he had joined and that, that, that we had the, the real prophet, you know, who actually came from he, his lineage, his, his priesthood came right from Joseph Smith hmm. down through his grandfather, a great grandfather down, you know, mm -hmm. to where Joseph Smith or, or Joel, our prophet Joel was the true prophet of God. Joel LeBaron. Joel LeBaron. Okay. <clears throat> yes. And so um, my dad was uh, instrumental in seeing that missionaries and they were Joel and Ervil LeBaron visited my Aunt Thelma and her family and uh, they also soon joined the LeBaron church. Okay. And they came from Utah? Did they they did. Utah? They came from Utah, right? Close to Salt Lake area. Okay. So okay. that's how that happened. And so Rena and I were both raised as uh, young girls in the Joel LeBaron Church. And so they moved down there and you and, and you were a little older than Rena, however. I was about five years older than Rena. Uh-huh. And Rena and her family actually didn't move right to Colonial LeBaron. They moved to Ensenada, Baja, California. And then with, with the intentions of moving further down the Baja California Peninsula to the sister colony of Colonial LeBaron that was being pioneered down there. It was called Los Molinos. And they were going to assist in the pioneering of this new colony. And the purpose for these colonies and the purpose for the reason we were in Mexico in the first place was we believed that the, the, uh, the United States was going to be destroyed. It was going to be happen, happening soon. And Joel's mission as a prophet was, of course, to spread the gospel to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, mm -hmm. and to bring uh, the chosen people out of, you know, out of the world, and to take them to Mexico, where it was a land of safety. And and so when the destructions of the United States happened, we would be in places of safety. Mm -hmm. So he went, he, he and, and not just Joel, but the other uh, LeBaron boys would go up through areas of the United States, not just Utah, no. and recruit and Absolutely. proselytize and bring people down. They were missionaries. And they, they would bring uh, the Mormons from the Mormon, mainline Mormon church into the fundamental. Most of our converts came out of the LDS church, just mm -hmm. as my, my family did. My, my mom and dad came out of the LDS church. Because. And uh, and Rena's family came out of the LDS Church, uh -huh. but Rena was raised in um, in first in Ensenada and then in Los Molinos from the time she was three. She was three when her folks joined the church. Mm -hmm. okay. So that was uh, where she got her beginning. Okay. You know, and that's okay. what we had in common. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, all that happened in the group happened to both of you. You both were yes. aware, more or less basically, of the things that were going on with the, the church, the profit, the growth, and the poverty, and, oh, yes. and, and all of that that went with it. Right. Okay. 
Uh, she, Rena was the youngest of five children, I believe there were seven. Actually, there were seven children. Seven children. Yes, and she was the youngest. And she was the youngest. Now, her um, older sister, Lorna? Lorna. Now, why don't you tell us how she got involved with Ervil? Lorna was 17 and was not out of high school yet when her mom uh, basically decided to join um, the LeBaron group. And I say her mom, not her dad, because it took her dad several years before he came around and also joined. But Lorna had met Joel and Ervil LeBaron when they came to, to uh, be missionaries for her mother. Mm -hmm. And Ervil um, liked what he saw in Lorna. She was 17 and I believe he was, oh, close to 40 in his late 30s. And Ervil had um, three wives. He had had actually four, but at this point he only had three wives. Mm -hmm. And he, um, without, Thelma, no, without my Aunt Thelma knowing about it, he took Lorna aside and uh, let her know that she was to become his wife. And so there's a 17-year-old girl, girl still in high school, and he basically proposed to her. Hmm. She, uh, he, she believed that he was a prophet of God. Hmm. So she went to her mother, explained to her mother that, uh, that Ervil had asked her to marry him. And Thelma had said, uh, you know, this is your choice. You realize it's going to be a different life than what you've been raised with. It's going to be, you're going to be a plural wife. You're going to be living in uh, very uh, basic circumstances such as adobe homes, no plumbing, no you know, none of the amenities that you're used to. Can you deal with this? Mm -hmm. And she says, you better pray about this and decide what to do. So she did mm -hmm. and decided that she would become Herbal LeBaron's wife. So she became his fourth wife. And she really didn't know what she was doing. She had no obviously. idea. And they were still living in Utah at that time? They were still they living in Utah. They there. hadn't moved yet. Okay. So that was so Marina's when uh, sister. And of course, her, her dad at this point didn't know what was going on. He, he was not excited about these missionaries, didn't want anything to do with them. So Ervil married Lorna with Thelma's blessing without her dad's knowing anything about it. Hmm. So wow. uh, yeah, he took her down to Mexico, wow. snuck her away from, from the, the home life, and mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. she, she moved down to Colonial LeBaron at that time. Mm -hmm. And then eventually the parents did with Rena, and they, yes, and they, they later took up they their did. residence down there. They did. They, oh, they, wow. they didn't move to Colonial LeBaron. They came down to visit a few times. I remember that. You know, they'd come to our house because mm -hmm. we were their relatives there. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, <laughs> so then they, they moved down there, and... Um, Rena starts to grow up, mm -hmm. and um, Ervil's eyes are roving around here, and he's taking up more wives. Yes. Um, you know, I think that uh, I saw it myself, I guess, because I was married by this time to Ervil's younger brother, Verlin. Mm -hmm. And I had moved to, Verlin had moved me to Los Molinos. And so I was around the Shinoth family a lot. In fact, uh, Verlin moved me right into the Shanoth home, and I, I became part of their family. They became like a, a second family to me. Mm -hmm. And Rena was like my little sister. I mean, we'd have so much fun together. She was, she was uh, several years younger than me, but we had a lot of fun together. Mm -hmm. And so, um, even though you were married, and I was married, but married. I was, I mean, I was barely you were fifteen. Still a kid, I was yeah. still a kid myself. Right. So, um, I know that Ervil was. They, they they had him, they, they felt like it was holy ground wherever Ervil stepped. He was, they believed that he was a prophet of God and they felt very, very blessed as a family to have him be their son-in-law or their brother-in-law, you know. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, they waited on Ervil hand and foot when he'd come over and, I mean, they would just all a Twitter in the Janoth home mm -hmm. whenever Ervil came around, mm -hmm. so... And Ervil hadn't made his move yet to try and overtake no. the prophet ship from No, at that point, Joel. he and Joel still got along with one another. Okay. But trouble was brewing yeah. in the church because yeah. of Ervil. Yeah. Uh, he and Joel were, uh, became at loggerheads with one another over doctrinal issues. And um, Joel ended up taking Ervil's authority away from him. And um, eventually, he, um, he told Ervil he had to leave the church, that, that he, was, he excommunicated him. Was that before or after he married Rena? Um, that was before. Before he married, he mar Rena. married Rena. Yes. And then he started the, his own church. He, he organized Herbal, a church of Herbal his own. Split away from Joel's church, 
and he had several people, several of the different families that that believed that he was right, not Joel. Uh huh. That his stand was right. And the Shanoss took the his Shinoss side. The Shanoss took Irville's side, right. and they they moved away from Los Molinos uh, when when Irville did, and they went. Uh, Basically, they went into hiding. Mm -hmm. They they moved to the United States. They left us. Um, it wasn't long after they left that Joel Irville had his brother Joel, who was our our prophet, mm -hmm. murdered, and mm -hmm. that was Irville's first murder. That Joel he, was yes, uh, and, and to kind of to set um, maybe the record straight at this point, mm -hmm. um, the the violent side of all of this came from Irville. It didn't come from Joel or Verlin. They came from Irville's side, right? Right. After Irville left, he immediately started sending sending threatening um, letters to us as a church, and from what we gathered later, also to other polygamist groups, mm -hmm. threatening us, saying that we needed to um, come under his umbrella, we needed to believe in him, that he, he claimed to be Jesus Christ's personal representative on the face of the earth, mm -hmm. and that we had to accept him as such, pay tithe to him and join his church or he said blood would run. Okay. So that was the beginning of the blood atonement. Mm -hmm. The threats. Yes, the, the, the threats. The, the fear that he wanted to instill. Yes. So let's get back to Rena and Irville. Mm -hmm. um, Rena's growing up now. She's say 12, 11, 12 or whatever. And right. Irville's got his eye on her already, right? Right. Um, the way Rena told the story to me is Irville took her aside one day. She was alone with with Irville and he told her that he'd had a revelation from God that she was to become his he, uh, his wife she was to be part of his family and that she had been chosen by God to do this that she was special and um, that she was very blessed to be chosen for Irville mm -hmm. and of course she was yeah, very typical. young she was uh, impressionable and she she was. She had been raised to believe that Irville was exactly who he said he was. She saw it from her her parents, her brothers, her older brothers, Mark and Dwayne. They all upheld Irville as a prophet of God. So how could she not believe him? And her sister was married to him. Plus, already. her sister was married. Her older sister was married to him. Irville told her, uh, "You know, this is between you and me. You're to keep this secret. I don't want you telling even your." <coughs> Excuse me, please. <coughs> Excuse me. I don't want you to even talk to your, fa your, your parents about this. This is our secret and it needs to stay that way. And Rena tell, told me that at that time, Irville sexually molested her. Oh my. And she was yes. about what? That she time, was 12? Uh, I think she was 12. Maybe she was 13, but I believe that she was 12. And he told her, he explained it to her that there are some things that uh, God allows engaged couples to do with each other that is okay, uh -huh. and that this was okay, and uh, she oh, yeah, she believed him. Okay, so, being a prophet of God, a prophet of God can't do wrong. Right. And, and she questioned it, but she believed him that it's okay to do this. And 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 I don't don't want to get into your personal story here, but that almost that almost happened to you with Irville. Yes, uh, it did. As you were growing up, and he had his eye on you, and yes. he would have molested you if if circumstance hadn't uh, yes, somebody barged in it. the room or something right, while yeah. you while that was going on. So yes, that's true. Uh, so Lorna, the older sister, was married to Irville, but she mm -hmm. did not know that his eye was on Rena. No, um, Rena was told to keep it quiet. And what she did, mm -hmm. and so Lorna really had no idea what was going on for quite a long time. Mm -hmm. Once okay. she did find out that Irville wanted Rena and that he planned to take her, she was disgusted by it. Yeah. And from that point on, Lorna did not treat Rena as a sister. She, that's she was bad. very cold to her. Yeah, that's that's too bad. Again, it goes against what the Bible says, anyway. You know about uh, rival sister wives. Of course, it's, it's not what God had in mind. Yeah. Um, I suppose, along with the rest of you folks down there in mm -hmm. living polygamy in Mexico, and, and many and most of the other polygamous wives everywhere, that Irville's wives were neglected? I think probably Irville's wives were more neglected than any than other family. Irville was, uh, he was just not um, in tune with his family or their needs. I know that um, Joel, and my husband Verlin many times had to uh, bail Irville's families out 
take take money for his families because they they were destitute so mm. many times. Wow. Ervil was uh, not. Uh, he didn't believe that he should have to do physical labor. Um, he, you know, God had blessed him with all of this intellect uh, to understand the scriptures and to expound on the scriptures and to um, to preach to people and to be a missionary and to bring all of these people into the church. Mm -hmm. And it was a waste of his talents to, to have to work to and support his families. So his families were pretty much taken care of by uh, tithing money and stuff like that. Mm, my goodness, how sad. How yes. sad for the, how many children did he have? Well, you know, um, he eventually ended up, uh, before his death, he ended up with, I believe it was 58 children. So, No, no single person can, unless you're a millionaire plus, can handle... Uh, uh, definitely not, not in any way, not, not, not financially, uh, definitely not emotionally, right. not in any way. No way so. can you be a true father to no. those many children. It's obscene, actually. Uh, and so let's go back to Rena now. What was her relationship with her parents? Did they, was she obedient to them? Did she respect them? And did, did they? Oh, uh, very much. They, they loved each other? Very there much. was a loving home? Her, oh, very, very <coughs> much so. In <coughs> fact, that's part of what attracted me to that family when I married Verlin and he basically moved me in with him. It was like I had a second family. They were so wonderful, so close knit. And I'm sure that that's why Rena's parents um, had such an impact uh, as far as what they believed, the way they believed in Ervil was such an impact on Rena. She didn't question Ervil at all. Excuse me. Excuse me. She didn't question his motives. She didn't question who he was um, because her parents believed in him so strongly and her older brothers, Mark and Dwayne, also, they championed Herbal. So um, Rena just went along with it. But when he proposed to her and they actually decided to get married, didn't it kind of turn her really off? Didn't, didn't Rena kind Not of at get first. repulsed at that? Not at first. No, at first uh, she believed that he was a prophet of God and, and he made her feel special. He made her feel very special. She was chosen by God. Oh my goodness, me? I, I kind of, I can relate to that because, um, you know, as you said, Ervo tr pulled the same thing on me uh -huh. when I was a, a young girl. I was 14. And he said God told him he to told marry He told me you. that God had had a revelation that I was to marry him. Mm -hmm. And I bought into it for a while. Yeah. And it made me feel special. And so I can understand how it made Rena feel, mm -hmm. you know. So she wasn't turned off until after they were married then? You know, as basically. she got older, I guess I, I really think that Ervil uh, pulled these moves on her when she was too young. Yeah. If he would have waited until she was 16 to do this, but as time went on from the time she was 12 and then 13 and then older, you know, um, she got kind of tired of the thought of Ervil. And she had other guys. I mean, Rena was a beautiful young lady. Mm -hmm. She had a lot of guys who... Uh, who wanted to court her, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and uh, in the in the communities where we were raised, from the time we were 13, 14 years old, um, we had a lot of suitors. We had a lot of guys that let us know that, that they would be honored to have us uh, as one of their wives. Single or married? It didn't Absolutely didn't both, matter. Both, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, you know, Rena told me stories of um, a, a father and two of his sons who all within the same two-day period all came to her and let her know that they wished that wow. she would marry them. Wow. <laughs> oh, so. what a convoluted mess, I oh, must yes. say. Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so they got married. Now she's t she turned 16. Yes, and but, but let, let, me, let me just back up just a little bit and tell <laughs> you that once she got to be 16 years old, by this time, Joel had been murdered, uh, Joel the prophet of the of my church, mm -hmm. you know, had been murdered. Uh, Rena and Ervil and all of these guys were basically in hiding. Uh, Ervil had uh, the Shanoths and there were several families that backed him up. Dan Jordan's family and there was a lot of different, uh, he had a lot of henchmen is what, what I called him. Mm -hmm. And um, Ervil kept them all so stirred up and believing that the firstborners is the way that they would call Joel's church that okay. the firstborners were after them. 
So they believed that we were going to go kill them, which was absolutely not true. We, we never were, you know, but, but he had his people believing that they had to be in hiding and run from this point, this point to the other mm -hmm. because the firstborners are going to come and get, get us if okay. we don't move. So that's part of so his mind control there was technique a constant, that he was using on that. Yes, constant chaos going on within Herbal's group believing that they had to hide, that they needed to uh, have guns, and they needed, you know, I mean, just a fear. He controlled them with this fear. Uh -huh. And so um, Rena, by this time, had, you know, she'd had two or three different boyfriends that were closer to her, her age, and, and she had fallen head over heels in love with a, a young man. And every time that Herbal came around, he would remind her, you know, he tried to get her alone and give her hugs and remind her, um, you know, don't be getting involved with anyone else because... You're mine. Mm -hmm. One of these days, you're gonna you're gonna be mine. Mm -hmm. And so, as time went on, and she uh, found uh, other young men attractive, she realized that oh, Herbal's just he's old. He's yeah. not for me. Yeah. I don't want him there anymore. You, go. Uh -huh. you know. Yeah. So she was 16 when <clears throat> Herbal uh, threw his man Dan Jordan, who was the man that was the trigger in Joel LeBaron's death. Um, he told Dan to tell Rena that it was time for her to make a choice and to marry him. He wanted her to marry him that very night, that Dan was going to perform the ceremony, and that Rena needed to make that decision to marry him that very night, or she would go directly to hell. Oh, my. And she was 16. She was 16. She, her mind had him full. Oh, no, and she was away awful. from her parents. Mm -hmm. She didn't have her, anyone around. Um, she was devastated. She did not want to marry Herbal at all at that point. At the point she just could hardly handle being around him. Mm -hmm. So she screamed, well then I'll go to hell. I'll just, I'll choose hell then. I will not marry him. So um, she, she, you know, sat alone for a few hours, prayed, God, please come and rescue me. Please send someone to rescue me so that I don't have to go through with this. But she was ultimately so afraid of hell mm -hmm. that she caved. Yeah, so such a repeat so frequently of this very same thing goes on and on in these polygamy groups. Yes. Even it now, does. today. Yeah, so I'm many sure. Years ago. Wow. So she married him that night. She did that very night in her Levi's and her old dirty shirt that she had on. She didn't have anything clean to put on. She went in and Dan Jordan performed the sealing ceremony mm -hmm. as as uh, they believed in and as we believed in mm -hmm. and sealed her to him as uh, his 10th wife. 10th wife. Mm -hmm. Wow, and he had total. No, I think it was a thirteen. I think thirteenth uh, wife. He had. Uh, yeah, it was thirteenth. He wife, had a, thir I'm sorry. a total of thirteen. Didn't yes, and he? she was his last one, so it was okay. Thirteenth wife. wife. Yes. Wow, that's not a good number anyway. No, <laughs> <laughs> that's for sure. Now, did did Ervil know that, that by this time? Obviously, he knew that Rena didn't care for him, and he she, mm -hmm. he didn't have her under his thumb quite as much as he had maybe when she was twelve and growing right. up. Right. You know, but. Rena was Did a little he? rebel. Yeah. You know, she she couldn't make herself <clears throat> love Ervil. She said <clears throat> she tried very hard. She thought something was wrong with her because why is it that she couldn't make herself love God's prophet? Mm -hmm. Why is it that he turned her off so bad? Mm -hmm. And so she she tried to fake it with him and tried to make him think that she loved him, but she she didn't. And the, the, the reality, I asked her, I says, how do you know, did he know that you, that you were faking it? And she says, oh, he knew, but did he care? No. And that would have been my next question. Did he care? Did it bother him at all? No. No ego involved in no, that? No, she said that, that, it didn't, that it didn't bother him at all, <clears throat> that um, he was so busy with all of uh, running of his church and, and uh, pl plotting who he was going to be killing, you know, having killed next and... Uh, that he didn't have time to worry about his wives and his children. They were puppets to him, and she was one of them. Mm -hmm. She felt like she was, um, you know, there to take care of children and and um, keep the home fires burning and where all the guys would get together and, and plot their military strategies on mm -hmm. who would be uh, blood atoned next. Okay, so she get does she get pregnant before she gets pulled under his mind control to pull the trigger on the gun. She had um, her first daughter um, not too long after she and Erbil were married. I mean, within a, a year or two, a uh -huh. couple of years. Okay. So, um, but she, she never felt that she was important. You know, she was a woman. She was kind of held back uh, taking care of the home fires and things like this. Um, 
as all of the wives were. They none, were all very neglected. And, none and of she them didn't care. Right? No, none of them felt important. And, but she didn't care because she she didn't want to be close to Herbal anyway, so, so that was all good. That was good to leave them away. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so, so bring us up to the point to where um, she is recruited to become his henchman. He was using others to take care, take people out. Almost 30 people were, ki were killed before yes. this was over. And um, he used different people to do these different killings. He did. And Rena was one of these that he used. Well, you know, he, he called her and several of the other uh, young women in with the men in one meeting one particular day. And she was surprised that she was included in this meeting. A woman in a man's meeting yes, normally. Yes, because right? it was always the men, the priesthood men, uh -huh. that would get together and have their meetings. The women weren't really included in these. Yes. But this time they were included. And Ervil said that he had had a revelation that uh, there needed, uh, uh, that another, another killing was going to be done. The purpose for this particular killing was to bring my husband Verlin, his brother Verlin, out to flush him out into the open so that he could be killed. Because Get Irvel, him out of the way because he was in charge. Well, Ervil um, couldn't stand my husband Verlin. He called him the snake. Verlin would not um, agree to follow Ervil. And uh, Verlin was the head of Joel's church now that Joel had, was, was uh -huh, dead. Okay. And so um, Verlin topped Ervil's hit list. He, he, Ervil had tried several times to have him killed, but okay. none of those attempts were successful. So they really wanted Verlin gone. Uh -huh. So Ervil told his group with Rena in the room that he'd had another revelation about who was to be killed to flush Verlin out into the open so that they could get to Verlin. Mm -hmm. And the man that they were to be, uh, was to be killed was a rival polygamist leader. His name was Rulin Allred, and Rena told me that that was the first time she'd ever heard that name. Okay. And that God had let Ervil know that the two prettiest women in their group were to be the ones that took this man out. So when Rena was selected as one of them, at first she, she thought, wow, this is really amazing. I can't believe I get to do something in the group finally. I've always been kept in the background to mm -hmm. help with the cooking and the babies, you know. Yeah. So she felt important. And she absolutely believed that when Ervil said that this person had to be killed, that it was God that... that she believed it. She believed it. And, and God, God was, had ordered it through Ervil and that it had to be done. So it, it, to her, it wasn't murder at all. It was blood atonement. This man also had sinned. He, he needed to have his blood spilt in order to pay for his sins. Mm -hmm. And that was just like second nature to Rena. That's, that's, she believed it. So it is possible, you, you truly believe it is possible for one person to get a hold of another man or another person, another human being's mind and control it. Hmm. There's to no do question. things that they never would Absolutely. normally do. Absolutely. I've heard people say that's not possible, that it can't happen, that's just an excuse, you know, no. it's just a reason, a way it's to get not out an of, excuse. of being held responsible. That when, once you, I believe that, you know, um, uh, Satan loves to operate through people mm -hmm. like this. Mm -hmm. And he does. I agree with you. I agree. And it's I absolutely agree. possible. So she, and it, not just possible, but it, it, it happens. Well, why did why did Ervil choose her? What was his reason for that? He he had to have had an underlying reason. Rena believed that Ervil chose her as the shooter of Dr. Allred because he, he was afraid of losing her. He knew that she wasn't in love with him. He felt like she was going to be pulling away and he wanted he wanted her to be more committed and he felt like if she was more involved this way that he would have her more committed to his cause. Okay, so he did want to keep a hold of her then. Yes. Okay. Well, he wanted, he, he called him soldiers in his army. <laughs> yeah. Oh my, but so, and who was the other woman that was picked? It was another young woman who was the wife of, of uh, his right-hand man, Dan Jordan. Okay. It's a young woman named Ramona. Yeah. And I knew and her all, when she was a child. All of those are familiar names from all the news reports yeah. uh, as we go through this. Okay, well, let's get into um, the, what happened? They left 
and they left Texas. They made the plans for the murder. They left Me Mexico and came out through Texas. And Rena said that the actual, the plan and, and the thought of actually pulling this off and pulling the trigger on this man didn't seem real until it was right up to the time of actually doing it. Hmm. You know, driving there, um, stopping and finding um, disguises in a desert industries in Salt Lake, having the gun with them, all of the, everything that she had to do to prepare for killing this, this man that she had never met and that she had nothing against personally. Mm -hmm. um, it all didn't, it was surreal to her mm -hmm. right up until she actually got out of the car and was walking in there and getting ready to shoot him. Now let's go to Do let's go to Rulon Allred. He's the leader of the Apostolic United Brethren, the right. Allred Polygamy Group, uh -huh. and is still a very large, um, important is. group, a polygamy group here in, in Utah. Salt Lake. Mm -hmm. And he is a chiropractor. Yes. Right. Um, I forget how many wives he had, but so we won't worry about that right now. I believe it was but six, but I'm not sure. Something like that. Yes. Um, and he was very well liked. Yes, he was. He was very well liked, and um, so and, and so he, she, they go <coughs> into his working hours. He's a doctor in his chiropractic office. Right. It's working hours. There's there's uh, patients in the office, right? Right. And the plan was, Rena was to go in there with Ramona. The two of them were to see that he was shot. And then other members of Ervil's group, their young men, uh, Don and John, I believe their last name was Sullivan and Ed Marston, they were to be hanging out in Salt Lake after the murder was taken, had taken place to find out the, the plans for Dr. Allred's funeral because Ervil knew that Verlin would come out to Dr. Allred's funeral because Verlin was related by marriage to Dr. Allred and he very much respected this man. Mm -hmm. And so Dr. Allred's murder was a ploy to get Verlin to come out to the mm -hmm. funeral mm -hmm. in order to also right. kill him. Okay. So they, they go in the doctor's office. She spies him. Yes. She levels a gun at him. And, and she emptied she... her gun. I believe she said she shot seven times. Mm -hmm. And um, there was a, little, a few little things that went on there as far as... Uh, Ramona dropped something. They had to go back in and get it, you know, but uh, they, they ended up driving away and and they they were free. They got away. They got away. Yeah. Got away safe. Safe so far. Right. And Allred is dead on yes. the floor of yes. the waiting room. And the funeral happened and Verlin came, right? But Verlin it, came, it, but, uh, but they weren't able to get to him because they weren't expecting such a humongous crowd to come to this funeral. And they, there was police, there was, you know, mm -hmm. they, they couldn't get to him. So it, their attempt on Verlin's life failed. So it all failed. And right. Verlin's, and Allred is dead. Right. And now we have a, a, a murderer that is running for her life. Yes. Away from the authorities. It took, I don't know, several months, maybe a year, maybe longer, before the authorities finally caught up with Rena. They caught up with her in Mexico where she was in hiding. She was pregnant with her second child at this point. And they brought her back to Utah, and they put her through a trial. Mm -hmm. um, they believed that she was the killer. But as the trial went forward, they were not able to successfully prove that Rena is the one that killed Dr. Allred. So she was let go by lack of evidence. So Rena knew that she had done it. Mm -hmm. The longer that she was away from Ervil, the longer that she was away from the um, mind control. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, the more she began to realize that Erbil was a kook, uh, that she didn't want anything more to do with him, and that what she had done was was murder, mm -hmm. that, that she was guilty of murder. And she had to live with this horror for so many years. Um, Rena, Erbil uh, eventually died in prison. He, he died in 1981. He was captured and put into prison. Uh, for Dr. Allred's murder, for masterminding it. Mm -hmm. um, and Rena was free of Ervil. Um, Rena remarried a man named John. And in order, I, I don't know, I feel like Rena did this uh, trying to do penance for what she considered an unforgivable sin mm -hmm. of murder mm -hmm. because she was taught that murder is unforgivable. Unforgivable, right. 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 So she and her husband, John, took several of Ervil's younger children that had not really been involved in anything criminal, but they were just there, mm -hmm. you know. And, and they had seen their mothers murdered. And, I mean, we got to remember, Ervil was uh, 
guilty of almost 30 different murders, mm -hmm. many of them his own people. Of masterminding all of yes. them. He himself didn't kill anyone. He, didn't, he, he personally didn't pull the trigger on anyone or, right. or stab anyone. He, he had his other, people do, other people do it all for him, all of the dirty work for him. Yeah. But uh, a lot of them, one of them was my cousin Lorna. Ervil's wife. Uh -huh. She tried to defect, so Ervil had her killed. And she had eight kids, didn't she? Yes, she did. Eight kids. Uh, Ervil's own daughter was, uh, and she was pregnant. She's pregnant. Um, was causing problems for Ervil and his group, and so he had her killed. Um, they killed one another off it just a lot. Makes you wonder where the where the human feeling, the emotion uh, of all of this. I don't is know. Just I, I don't know. Totally That's, fried. It's 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 a really uh, unbelievable. I, I can't begin to understand it. Yeah. But um, Rena got away from this group. Um, she tried. She took. She and her husband John took several of Ervil's younger children in that were by this time they were orphans, mm -hmm. and they began to um, try to help these kids, put them through school, and to give them some love and some attention. And and I personally believe in listening to Rena that she did it, trying to find a way to absolve herself. Mm -hmm. Because she she thought that she was going to go to hell for sure. She'd committed a murder, mm -hmm. and there was no forgiveness for it. Yeah. And at this point, she didn't know Christ as her Savior at yeah, all. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, and when you don't think there's p forgiveness possible, you're not really going to be looking. No, no, you know, no, no. Because you're, you've given looking. up hope. It's a hopeless. She lived in a very hopeless situation. Yeah. Well, one day she had a woman come to her, and it was in a real traumatic point in her life, in Rena's life. And she had had a woman come to her, and this woman said to her, Rena, do you know Jesus as your personal Savior? And Rena says, well, I, I don't even know what that means. I don't even know what that means. And um, Rena said that this woman had such love in her eyes for Rena. She knew what Rena had done, and she loved her anyway. Hmm. And Rena said it was just like such a turning point. She started searching the scriptures. Hmm. Awesome. Wonderful. Looking for forgiveness. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. And she found it. She, she decided that she would do that on her own. She did. And she was able to find the scriptures on her own and, yes. and see that the forgiveness was made possible through... Through the blood of Jesus the being Jesus shed Christ. for her, and the scriptures that you read at the beginning of right. this, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. And so she realized that if she would accept Jesus as her personal Savior, that she could cast her burdens upon Him, uh -huh. and that she would be saved, and she would be forgiven for that murder. Um, now she she they took those children um, from as orphans from Mexico. Mm -hmm. and brought them to where they were living, her and her husband. Right. And she's got a new husband now, mm -hmm. and uh, he is supporting her. He's loving her like Erwell never did, of course. Exactly. And and he's supporting her in bringing these children in. Yes. And they are are supporting all of these children and raising them themselves. At one time, I believe she said there was 15 of Erwell's kids. Wow living in her home at one time that wow. she was trying to love and support and take care of. Uh -huh. And these were, they were all orphans. Uh -huh. Yeah, their mothers yeah. had been killed. Yeah. So um, I think a couple of those kids were even Rena's own little half siblings because mm -hmm. her dad, you know, had taken plural wives. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyway, so yeah, she, she, she and John went uh, above and beyond to try to help these wow. kids and they did it yeah. for several years. Yeah, and I met John while we were down there in El Dorado mm -hmm. as well. I met them right. both, and, and we did spend some quality time yeah. with them. Uh, they were awesome couple. Oh, yeah. Very down to earth, absolutely down they to are. earth. They are. They're wonderful. Yeah. I, am, I feel personally so blessed to have Rena a part of my life today. She has been an amazing blessing for me. Mm -hmm. um, we're there for one another. We, we love the Lord together, <laughs> and um, yeah. it's just it's great to have my cousin back again. And to have that freedom that Christ gives, mm -hmm. freedom for the forgiveness of sins. Oh, yeah. And she doesn't have to carry that burden around anymore. And she's with just her. such a joyful, happy person, so different than she says that she was throughout most of her life. And so, how many people do you suppose, perhaps in our viewing audience or people that she's met in other mm -hmm. areas, would say, uh, How dare you be walking free? Uh, what, how dare you even think you're forgiven? Um, because they are so unfamiliar or unable to believe that that Christ's blood indeed can cleanse that kind of a sin. 
Uh, oh yes, and <laughs> and you know we were raised. I was raised also in believing that that there is no forgiveness for murder, and uh, what a freeing thing it is mm -hmm. for both of us. Mm -hmm. I mean, not that I committed murder, but uh, I, you know, I lived polygamy for many years myself, and as re as did Rena, and uh, to know that uh, that Jesus does cleanse all mm -hmm. sin. Uh, we and we we can't forget the scripture in the New Testament that says. Jesus said, if you hate your brother, you have committed murder in your heart. That's true. I forgot about that. The person that pulls the trigger is no more guilty than the one who walks around with hatred towards someone else because that's the source. That's yes. where it starts is a heart matter. It's true. And so we can't, none of us, none of us have any business ever trying to judge someone else on a sin that they have committed. Okay, uh, this is basically the story of Rena Shanoth, and I thanks, thank you so much, Susan, for oh, coming and sharing this with us. Um, I think that this story just shows us even more clearly and, and speaks to us again the necessity to follow God's will through knowing His Word. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of the show tonight, uh, so many false religions flourish and thrive because of biblical illiteracy. And uh, we've just heard a story of a woman who, who was involved in something like that. And in fact, all of the polygamy is involved in that kind of thing. You know, anyone who knows their Bible and, and learn, gets to know the God of the Bible would know the answer to several false teachings that you receive. I'm going to mention some of them here. For one thing, if you knew your Bible and the God of the Bible, you would know that polygamy is not something that God has required. Living the United Order is not a command from God you would know that Jesus Christ is indeed God Almighty. Um, that is in the Bible and it's undisputed. You would know that no one has priesthood authority over someone else and that there's only one high priest and that's Jesus Christ. That people of the church are all over the world of God's church who are saved by the grace of Jesus Christ. Did you know that Jesus said that we would be judged by His Word in the last day? John 12, 48. And if we're going to be judged by the words of Jesus Christ, don't you think we ought to know what those words are? We're not going to be judged by the words of the Book of Mormon or Joseph Smith or Brigham Young. We're going to be judged by the words of Jesus Christ. Read His Word. Become familiar with His Word. Know His Word if that's going to be your judge. It's your salvation. It isn't ours. And do you know that salvation is indeed a gift from Jesus Christ. And we thank you for joining us tonight. We do appreciate you being here. You have a standing invitation to be with us each week on polygamy. What love is this? Good night. God bless.